Greetings and welcome to The Vortex, where we explore the mysteries of the world and beyond. I'm your host, Daniel Allen Jones, and today I'm very honored to be here with my next special guest, who is the senior astronomer for NASA's SETI Institute, as well as an author of hundreds of scientific papers and multiple books, including one of mine here. What I really like uh, is The Confessions of an Alien Hunter, incredible book, which we'll be getting into as well um, as a prolific science communicator. And it's just uh, amazing to see uh, the many accolades of Dr. Seth Shostak. Doctor, it's an honor to be able to have you here with us. Welcome to The Vortex. Thank you very much, Daniel. So you've done an amazing job of not only communicating scientific ideas and being able to provide them to the public in a way that makes sense, um, but you're dealing with a lot of really interesting subjects that many people usually relegate to science fiction. When it comes to SETI, this is this, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. What's fascinating about this is that it's not just extraterrestrial life you're looking for, although that's a proponent of it, it's intelligent life. So it's not subtle, it's not just extraterrestrial life, it's intelligent life. So. Uh, give us a little bit of a, a, a history, um, a preface of how this organization has come about and sort of the journey it's taken to get to the point where it is now, if you don't mind. Well, the idea that there might be aliens out there, that's nothing new, actually. Uh, you know, you can go back 2,500 years and the ancient Greeks, the, the classical Greeks, if you will, they were already talking about how probably everything in the sky was occupied by either men <laughs> or men-like creatures, or women, or gods, right? They just assumed that. And uh, the Greeks were not big on doing experiments, so they didn't invent telescopes or anything like that that might have helped them to learn more about these places where they had, you know, these places they had populated with the inhabitants. But they at least, uh, you know, sort of broached the idea. Really, there were some ex experiments that were being done by people like Tesla, Right, Nikola Tesla, not the automobile guy, but the 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 electrical engineer, who was doing things near the beginning of the 20th century, in which he was trying to see if he could prove that there might be somebody out there. Uh, he was building these big static electricity devices, Tesla coils, and so forth, are sort of a the 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 follow up to that. And he was trying to see if he could pick up signals from other worlds, and in particular, Mars. So, uh, and by the way, I think that he felt that he had picked them up. Marconi, who was, of course, a radio pioneer, he also thought he had heard the Martians. The Martians were busy with their own broadcast schedule, I guess. But in any case, uh, you know, that, that was sort of the history here. But it wasn't based on very much astronomy. We didn't have enough astronomy to really know whether Mars or any of the other nearby worlds actually had any uh, inhabitants. But beyond that, we also didn't have any way to find them. And that changed uh, after the Second World War, and in particular in 1960, when a guy by the name of Frank Drake did the first modern SETI experiment, which he used you know, sophisticated receivers to try and pick up signals coming from the skies. It's incredible to see how far things have come. Uh, and even in just the short amount of time, the, the few decades, it seems, um, to lead up to what we're dealing with now and all the possibilities. I think there's a lot of potential for the scientific work that you've been doing for a number of years, as, as well as how this connects to a, a larger scale of, of what people can learn about with not just what's here in a world, but the rest of the universe and how that changes the scope of awareness for all of society. And, and that being said, when it comes to SETI, it's something that you know people, I think, generally wonder, how are you going to communicate how are you going to search? How are you going to find these aliens? And, and to do a little bit of a you know, less considered uh, scientific method of here, uh, channeling in, of course, Enrico Fermi, wondering, where are they? So you know, how are some of these things being done? What are the techniques and methods behind SETI's instruments that, that are being used to try to ascertain the evidence? What are, what are the types of things that we can see that most people probably you know, think are too technical that help this type of effort to go? Well, there's no doubt, Daniel, that the technology being used for SETI experiments today, obviously it's quite a bit different than it was even, even 20 years ago. But the basic idea is very simple. Everybody can understand the idea, right? And, and that is that, look, if the galaxy, or for that matter, the universe is populated by beings, whatever they look like, 
beings that you know have developed science and technology, okay, then they're probably using radio transmitters. Well, when I say radio, that means television too and radar. All of that is radio. That they're using transmitters to try and get information from one place to another. And it might, you know, just be the top 40, or it might be, you know, telephone, long distance telephone. I mean, whatever it is, okay, you can send any kind of information on a radio beam. Okay. So the idea was, well, look, if the galaxy is populated by other societies, presumably all of them using radio, if they've gotten that far with their technology development, then if we just point a big antenna at the sky, aim it maybe in the direction of some nearby star systems, maybe we'll pick up the, the radio traffic. We'll just eavesdrop on their radio traffic. That's the idea. And that hasn't changed, right? Uh, we don't broadcast inquiries and ask for the aliens to reply and you know, say, hey, look, where are the Earthlings and let us know if you're out there, right? Because, I mean, that might or might not work, but, be, you know, that's a sociology question. But the real problem with it is that the nearest aliens might be, who knows how far, they might be dozens of light years, they might be hundreds, they might even be a thousand light years away. And that means, you know, you say something to them and it takes up to a thousand years, say, for them to get the message, you know, and then another thousand years, you've got to wait for the reply to come here. And at that point, you, you know, you're not so keen on the whole project. So the idea here was, look, we're not going to provoke them into talking to us. Let's just see if anybody's using the airwaves. Yeah, it's fascinating. I think that it's, you know, one of the things that we uh, see, obviously, throughout the, the last century, technology has made vast improvements, as you just mentioned. Um, and when it comes to the exponential factor that this technology is improving, um, some refer to this as Moore's Law. Could you describe how maybe that comes into effect with the, uh, the ability for something like SETI to be able to, to find more or to gather more data with the advances in modern technology? Yeah, well, Moore's Law, named after Gordon Moore, who was one of the co-founders of the Intel Corporation. If you have a PC at home, you know, you've got products from the Intel Corporation in there, in particular the processor. But uh, I'm speaking to you here from the Silicon Valley. We're located about an hour south of San Francisco in the lovely glamorous town of Mountain View, which is, again, the Silicon Valley. Now, in order to sell more computers, right, they you, you need that the product have a certain degree of obsolescence, right? You buy your laptop and, uh, you know, it, it probably still works after five years. It might still work after 55 years, right? There aren't any moving parts, maybe the fan. But, I mean, you know, there's a very long-lasting technology. It's not like your car. Right? So, uh, as a consequence, there isn't much incentive for you to replace your computer unless something forces you to do that, or at least encourages you to do that. And what does encourage you to do that is this rapid development of the technology here. You know, the, these companies around here, they want to sell more chips. They want to sell more computers. And in order to do that, they just keep speeding up the equipment. The way they normally do that is by putting more and more transistors on the chip, right? So just more mechanism in there, if you will. And uh, Moore's Law, he, Gordon Moore remarked on this, 30 some years ago, I think, he, he noticed that the number of transistors on one of these chips, they're very small, uh, was doubling about every 18 months. So that's an exponential increase, right? So every, every two, two years, say, you know, the speed of the computer that you can buy for any given price point, say $1,000, doubles. So you buy, you buy a laptop and then five years later, you know, it still works. You still got your software installed on it, but all the really nifty new software won't run on it because it's too slow. So you have to go out and buy a new computer. So that's the idea. That's the economic uh, law of the Silicon Valley, Moore's Law. But if you're looking for aliens, you're also using electronics and you're using a lot of computers. And the, the consequence of all that is that about every two years, the speed of your search also doubles. So that's good news and bad news. The good news is, you know, when you speed up the search, you might uh, find something a little quicker. The bad news is that, uh, you know, you've got to replace a lot of the equipment. Well, it's it's just uh, it's really interesting to see how something like that can help us. Um, you know, as you mentioned, we, we see that as that exponential factor might double every few months. And now um, that's probably changed quite a bit with not only the the time frame, but also the materials used to produce technology and ma manufacture certain things as well. But when it comes to the search, it makes us wonder, um, 
is and you mentioned you know is it a, a sociological type of factor when we wonder is it safe to try to commune is it safe for us to try to respond or elicit a response and many people uh, various figures and and those who have come forward to you know, propose various ideas. Carl Sagan was a, a big proponent of, of contact. Obviously, this is something that I think um, has been a big way for a lot of people to, to know about this type of subject or this issue of connecting with other worldly civilizations. He was someone who went out there and tried to make sense of how we can find out more. But then you have other people who look at this in a different light. Uh, uh, Stephen Hawking, for instance, uh, had looked at this in a way that we probably shouldn't be trying to elicit responses, that it might not turn out or bode well for us. Uh, what are your thoughts on maybe the dynamic between those two extremities of, of uh, you know, scientific figures of their caliber, both having reputable status, but also having, uh, you know, various views, maybe that are, um, you know, not always lining up, but help us see the, the, the real challenges that we might face in this endeavor? Yeah, well, look, SETI is a listening experiment. So we're only listening. We, we don't try uh, transmit anything. Now, that's primarily because if the aliens, as I mentioned earlier, if the aliens are, you know, 100 light years or 1,000 light years away, the experiment's going to take a long time before you can even hope for some sort of result because the signal has to get to the aliens and they have to get their response to you, even assuming they're going to give you a response Right, they, they might be on summer vacation or something, and they didn't even pick up your transmission. So, I mean, there there is that. But in addition to that, there are other people who say, "Look, just as you suggested, Daniel, that letting the aliens know where we are by sending out a signal might not be a good idea. You don't know whether they're hostile or whether they just like to read poetry all day long. I mean, you don't know. So, uh, there are people who advise against broadcasting now." You know, that makes for an interesting story, sort of, but it's it's kind of irrelevant because to begin with, SETI doesn't transmit. But <laughs> beyond that, not only not transmitting, but because of the time scales involved, it wouldn't make a whole lot of sense for us to tr transmit, transmit very much of anything. Not, not everybody agrees with that. Uh, one of the guys who used to work at the SETI Institute uh, is actually trained in uh, psychology, I believe. And, you know, He's interested in actually transmitting simply to alert the aliens that were here and maybe encourage them to try and get in touch. That might work. It, all, it depends on whether the aliens have any interest in doing that. But in general, SETI experiments do not transmit. They're just listening. And there's no danger in listening. I mean, you tune in your favorite DJ on the, your car radio, and there's very little danger that that uh, DJ is going to jump into the car and give you a hard time because, obviously, the DJ doesn't know you're listening. <laughs> right. So it's one of those things where I think that uh, it's depending on the, the direction of the focus of a particular group organization, as you mentioned with SETI, it's not uh, concerned as much with transmitting, uh, you know, and receiving something that would be a communication. I think that would be fascinating to consider how that would play out. Obviously, it's something we, many wonder about how that would take place, but to just find signals that represent uh, technological sophistication beyond just, uh, and many ways as you've put and suggested in your work, um, microbes or something that's not really considered intelligent. Um, and with the work that you've published regarding astrobiology, we, we find that there may be many planets that are habitable, um, but might not necessarily have intelligent life, but could be very much like what we see here with the, the fauna upon Earth. And, and that's something I think it's it's important for us to distinguish is that, again, you're you're not necessarily looking for just the the life itself, but if there are advances in any of those uh, life forms that have reached the scale of being able to communicate and transmit frequencies. And so when it comes to this, there are a lot of ways that people have considered how to uh, enumerate the, the groups out there. And you mentioned earlier um, Drake and and what I'd like to do now is is throw some concepts at you, and uh, in hopes of you sharing a little bit about your impressions on what these ideas are, how they uh, uh, are applied scientifically, and maybe their effectiveness. Um, the first one, of course, being Drake's equation. Yeah, well, Drake's equation. First of all, who was Drake? Drake uh, his his name is Frank Drake, Frank Donald Drake, and uh, he actually did the first modern SETI experiment. Uh, he had taken a job after getting his graduate degree from Harvard University, 
uh, it was 1960. He took a job at the National Radio Astronomy Observatory, which is got its telescopes, or at least at that time, had all of its radio telescopes in a place called Green Bank, West Virginia. And uh, it wasn't because the cuisine in Green Bank was that exceptional. It was that not many people lived there. As a consequence, it was radio quiet. So that's what you want if you're building big antennas and trying to hear uh, noise from the cosmos. Not SETI noise. It wasn't built for that. But nonetheless, uh, they had just purchased sort of a, an antenna kit and put that together in 1960. There was this antenna that was, well, it was like 80 feet in diameter, something like that, 25 meters, I believe. And the director of the observatory, you know, had this shiny new antenna. He also had a shiny new employee, Frank Drake. And he said to Frank, look, think of something to do with this thing. And so Drake did something that he had always wanted to try because, you know, he was a fan of the idea of life in space and science fiction and stuff like that. And he thought, well, I'm going to point this antenna at a couple of nearby stars and hope that one or the other or both, you know, also have planets and some planets with uh, a broadcasting society on it. He called it Project Ozma, based after the Frank Baum book. And uh, he spent two weeks on this project. That's all. Very short. He, he didn't buy any equipment, didn't really have to. Uh, he tried to keep the whole project very low budget so as not to uh, antagonize anybody. <laughs> And uh, he didn't find the aliens, but you know everybody took a tremendous interest in this. And as a consequence, unwittingly, Frank Drake had started the whole science of SETI by doing this first experiment. And it began, as I say, either in the, the hills of West Virginia. Excellent. And I think that's something that, you know, as uh, I mentioned earlier, it's it's wonderful to see he wrote this forward to your book. I think it's impressive to know that he's still around. He's still considered a pioneer of this work and that you're continuing that effort in, in many ways as well and, and honoring that legacy. And to precede that in uh, some way, there was someone who came before who this has been attributed to, but may claim that this is something that has been a, a spouse for many years, uh, even prior, but the Fermi paradox. Tell us about what that implies and what that really means for us, the Fermi paradox. Yeah, well, first off, let me mention in passing that unfortunately, in passing, Frank Drake has passed on. Uh, last September, he died, uh, which was, you know, very sad for all of us who knew him. He was you know, he was a real pioneer. Actually, he really was. But the Fermi paradox was named after the Italian-American physicist Enrico Fermi. And Fermi didn't do any SETI work, but he was sort of interested in it. Uh, you know, it, uh, it was an, a novel idea at the time that he was thinking about it. And he was working at uh, uh, the laboratories Los Alamos in New Mexico, actually. And at a lunch, you know, he just... He was taking two, some bites out of his sandwich, and he was dining there with a couple of other physicists from the lab, and he just said, so where is everybody? You know, Fermi is very, very bright, as were the people that were having lunch with him, and he didn't really need to explain very much what he meant by that. But what he meant was, look, if the universe is chock-a-block with uh, intelligent beings, why don't we have any evidence that they're there? That's what he was asking. It's a good question, even today. So the paradox that Fermi was... Uh, pointing out was, well, we think that there, I mean, you know, there are hundreds of billions of star systems in the Milky Way galaxy. We can see a couple of hundred billion other galaxies, each of the couple of hundred billion star systems. So there's plenty of real estate, and yet we don't seem to have any evidence that anybody's in that, you know, vast cosmos. And so that was his question, where is everybody? It was, it was just a, a lunchtime provocation for the people he was chowing down with, I think. And it's a, a really valid sentiment, as you said, even today, people wonder if, if the universe is teeming with life, if our scientific and cosmological models are accurate, then it seems like, if not anything else, you know, a, a fraction of, of those estimations should still show that there should be plenty of it, um, as you put, in the real estate. And I think that's uh, curious to wonder, where is everybody? Where are they, right? So, you know, that being said, uh, many people have also consider that maybe there are explanations for this issue. Um, when it comes to some of those, people have proposed some of the ideas uh, pertaining to the zoo hypothesis or the dark forest 
What are your thoughts on these concepts? Well, first, for those who don't know what they are, uh, the zoo hypothesis it tries to explain the fact that we don't see anybody or hear from them or get any other clues of their existence uh, simply because the, we're, a, we're an exhibit in a cosmic zoo, right? That, uh, you know, we're the new kids on the block. Homo sapiens has only been around for about 300,000 years thereabouts. Uh, there are other societies out there that could, well, I mean, the universe is billions of years older than the earth. So there could be societies out there that are billions of years more advanced than we are. So we're kind of the, the new kids. And, uh, you know, that, 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 that thought that we're the new kids, you know, could lead them to keep hands off us because they don't want to. It's a, like the prime directive they used to have in Star Trek, right? You just don't mess with a society that's less advanced than you because you could trounce them if you wanted to, but that isn't a very nice thing to do. So the, the idea is that, yeah, they're out there uh, and they're watching us because, well, they're just, you know, the, the, the evolutionary biologists on their planet might want to know what happens to us or something. I mean, for whatever reason. So we're exhibits in a zoo, unwitting, and we don't know that we're exhibits in a zoo. So that's the zoo hypothesis. Now, the the other thing you mentioned was... The dark forest. Oh, the dark forest. Yeah. Well, the dark forest, <laughs> that's a more modern term. That's why I had to think about it. The, the dark forest is to say that, look, you know, no matter what you think of this whole subject, maybe you shouldn't be broadcasting anything. I mean, as I mentioned, in the SETI world, we don't broadcast anything, but there are people who do. And uh, the argument against it is, look, it's like being in a dark forest, right? You don't know what's out there. I mean, it could just all be squirrels and, you know, a few birds or who knows what. But there could be stuff out there that could eat you. So it's better not to make too much noise, right? You're in the dark forest. So, you know, that point of view says, all right, just don't betray Homo sapiens existence by broadcasting any deliberate signals that hostile aliens may pick up and decide that, we might eventually pose a threat to their export markets or whatever, and just, you know, send their interstellar battle wagons to Earth and just flatten the planet. Uh, and that's kind of a paranoid point of view. And it would be very expensive for them to do that. So I don't know that it's terribly realistic, but there are people who say that, look, okay, maybe it's not very likely that if we broadcast into space, ah, we're the Earling, uh, Earthlings, that they're going to, you know, come in and destroy us all. But on the other hand, the consequences could be so severe that you just don't want to chance it, right? So uh, that's kind of the, the dark forest thing, the idea that, okay, we're here, but don't let them know we're here. Now, just to add one more point to all this, and that is that this, this whole little story about you know not making yourself known and all it isn't a very convincing story because we are making ourselves known. Not, not the SETI community, but television, Radio and in particular radar, those are all signals that leak off Earth, you know, without us even wanting them to. They just do, right? They go in straight lines, they shoot off the edge of the Earth, if you will. And so any aliens with sufficiently large antennas could pick up these signals, whether we want them to or not. So, you know, if you're going to worry about it, well, you can worry about it, but there's not much you can do about it. It's really fascinating to think about how much is, is uh, exposed here on Earth. And there are some ideas thrown around about if there may be beacons, uh, so-called, you know, what we can think of as beacons out there that would be uh, very obvious. Now, what are your thoughts on the possibility that others looking in, um, at least toward us, might see Earth in such a way? Would Earth be observed as a type of beacon in the sense that it's spewing and emissions and things that uh, show signs of obvious uh, manufacturing? Would that be something that you know we, we look for out there, but that other people, whoever else is out there, would um, see that might be obvious here on Earth? Well, depending on their level of technological uh, development, yeah, they could very well pick up something from the Earth. Now, a couple of caveats. To begin with, you know, if the aliens are 50 light years away, that's pretty close, actually, but let, let's say they're 50 light years away, the signal's taken 50 years to get to them. Okay, that's neither here nor there. But the facts are that at 50 light years, the signals from Earth, even the most powerful signals that we make, radar, right? Those are the most powerful signals we make. Uh, they, they get weaker with distance, of course. It's like your flashlight, right? You go out in the evening and aim the flashlight at your neighbor's 
house and it'll light up the house a little bit. But if you aim the flashlight at the moon, right, you're not going to see the reflected light, even though it's getting to the moon. Uh, you know, it's it's so weak by the time it gets there and back that you don't even see it. So, uh, you know, this is this idea that it's, you know, dangerous and that, you know, we're betraying ourselves. Well, we all of that is true. But, you know, it's it doesn't have much to do with SETI because SETI isn't doing that. Um, so I, 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 I think. These things are interesting stories, but there's, you know, they don't affect the the experiment very much because the experiment is a passive one. We're just trying to eavesdrop. We're trying to pick up signals. And, uh, you know, there's, as I said before, there's no danger in listening for signals, right? You can sit at home all day long and tune the dial of your, of your radio, and it just doesn't have much potential for a bad outcome. Well, it's something that I think, you know, when people wonder about these ideas and, and the reality behind it, it helps to have sh you know, light shed upon them in such a way that it's good to know that, you know, we have people such as yourself who are working on uh, doing what we can to try to understand signals and see what frequencies are out there. Um, knowing that we're emitting them, um, it's possible that there could be something else that we might notice as well. Um, some people have considered there are ways to... Uh, classify um, or categorize types of civilizations uh, that could potentially exist in the universe. What are your thoughts on the Kardashev scale and the type one through three civilizations? Yeah, well, uh, Kardashev was a Soviet physicist. He's, he's gone now, but Nikolai Kardashev. And what he said was, well, he just, he had a taxonomy scheme for, for uh, societies. He said, look, you've got three categories of societies, type one societies, use the energy available on their home planet, right? Type two will use the energy not only on their home planet, but the energy of their star, right? Their sun. And type three would use the energy available from all the stars in the galaxy, right? So that's a couple of hundred billion times more than available from their own sun. So, you know, if you categorize societies on the basis of their energy usage, these days, of course, it's <laughs> It's preferable to use less energy for various reasons that are obvious to all the listeners. But, you know, uh, it's also the case that if you want to measure a country's economy or a planet's economy, how much energy they use per inhabitant is a good measure. The more energy they use per inhabitant, you know, the more advanced the society is. We, we use quite a bit. I mean, you know, the average American here is running at about 10 kilowatts. That's the amount of energy usage. Right. So, I mean, that's adding up, you know, the car and all the lights in the home and the TV set in the corner and all this stuff, everything that you use that consumes energy is more or less adds up to 10,000 watts. Uh, how much did Julius Caesar use? Well, a lot less than that. He didn't, he didn't have electric service there in Rome, right? So uh, it is a measure of, you know, if you will, economic success to use more energy. But uh, Kardashev was just extending that a little bit by saying, look, you know, if you have technology that allows you to capture all the energy of your home star, in our case, the sun, you know, you're pretty advanced. And that would be true. I mean, Earth intercepts uh, only a couple of percent of all the energy emitted by the sun. And most of that just gets reflected into space by the clouds or the ocean or even the land. So we don't use very much of it. Uh, so we're really not a Kardashev type three society, or even for that matter, a Kardashev type two society. We're just, uh, we're just still doing baby steps. <laughs> yeah. And it seems like uh, we're maybe not even, you know, type one. It seems like maybe until we unify uh, as a collective civilization and we, uh, you know, work in equilibrium with the planet that we might be able to get to that point. Hopefully so. I'm at least thinking now that that's something that's a uh, possibility within our future. Um, some have speculated that a type two would be um, capable of producing and manufacturing structures that could be utilized, as you just mentioned, to uh, harness the energy output of a star or maybe several stars. Um, there's the notion of the Dyson sphere. Uh, what are your thoughts on something that's uh, a construct like the Dyson sphere, is this a practical notion or are we maybe um, looking at this uh, in a similar vein of our technology? What are your thoughts on the Dyson sphere? 
Well, for those who are not into Dyson spheres, this was just an idea by the uh, uh, physicist Freeman Dyson, British, but he also worked in the United States, worked at Princeton for quite a while, actually. And Freeman Dyson, you know, he was looking always at big picture things. And he said, look, if you're an advanced society, you don't let 99% of all the energy output by the sun go to waste. That's crazy, right? What is it doing for anybody? I mean, you're just going out into space. Right? And, and maybe, you know, the aliens have photos of our part of the galaxy and there's a little white dot. Oh, that's the sun, right? That's all that all that energy is doing for, for anyone, so, right? So uh, Dyson said, look, a better idea is this. Uh, take apart some, you know, useless planet, Neptune, Uranus, whatever. That's not really doing much for you. Or, or the asteroid belt would also work. And just build a big shell, a big, you know, if you will, a, a sphere. Well, it's not a sphere. It's just the shell of a sphere around the solar system so that the Earth is orbiting inside that shell. All right. They cover the inside of the shell with solar cells. So now you're collecting all the energy radiated, radiated by the sun. You convert it into electricity and then you beam it down to Earth so we can use it for, you know, video gaming or whatever we, you, we're going to use it for. Now, that would give us billions of times more available energy than we have now well, with all our fossil fuels and our nuclear fuels and, you know, the windmills and the solar panels and all that stuff. We'd have, we'd have you know, billions of times more energy and maybe we could do more interesting things. Um, maybe we could. I'm probably... I'm fairly certain we could do more interesting things. But the, the idea was only to say, look, if you're a society that's millions of years more advanced or even thousands of years more advanced than ours, you might be able to do this. So we should look for these Dyson spheres or partial spheres uh, out in space because really advanced societies may have done this. It's one way for them to get a lot more energy than, you know, digging up the landscape, looking for things they can burn. It's very interesting. And speaking of video games, uh, another and very similar thought is that of the Jupiter brain or, or Boltzmann brain, uh, or even considered it, uh, the Matryoshka brain. Are you familiar with this idea and, and how it's supposed to be something very similar to the Dyson sphere, but its function is that it simulates realities and in doing so might propose another completely tangential issue of if we exist within one of those many simulated realities, essentially sounds like um, a very challenging issue to, to undertake and, and more of a philosophical one. But what are your thoughts on the, the idea of a Matryoshka brain? Now, these Matryoshka brains, I mean, the, you know, the, the, the Matryoshka dolls, these Russian dolls, anybody who's been to Russia knows about these dolls, you can buy them all, the shops, and they nest one into the other. You know, it's a small one in the middle and then you, a bigger one and a bigger one. So, uh, you know, <laughs> I mean, what are you going to say about it? I mean, they they may exist, that kind of thing. It may be that, uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I guess what I'm trying to, struggling to get to is how this is relevant. Um, does it say anything about what the aliens might be like or what they might be interested in doing? And uh, I'm not sure that it does in, in either case, but it is, a, you know, I mean, it, it, it pertains to the aliens in this sense, because you're talking about brains within brains or brains in general. Uh, will the aliens have uh, brains that are bigger than ours? Well, some of them will, of course. Will they be smarter than we are? Well, probably a lot of them are smarter than we are, right? More, more technically advanced. I mean, our brains are, you know, they're one and a half pounds or three pounds or two pounds, a couple of pounds. Depends on whether you're a fat head or not. But, you know, it's just a couple of pounds. And we do everything that we do with, you know, essentially a machine that's only a couple of pounds, right? So, uh, you know, there's no reason that you should stop there. It's just that nobody can give birth to babies that are going to have 500-pound you know, brains. So that's that's where we're, we're limited by that. But, you know, you can beat all this by inventing artificial intelligence. We seem to be doing that as well. And then you can build the brain as big as you want consuming essentially as much power as you want. And in fact, you could imagine combining these two ideas that we've been talking about, that you you know, you know build a, a Dyson sphere or a partial Dyson sphere, and you use it to power a, you know, an artificial brain. And uh, now you, you can, you know, not only can you play a lot of games of chess, uh, you can also, you know, probably work out all of science too. I mean, you know, and probably write a few good short stories as well. 
Awesome. So, uh, you know, on the thought of video games and simulations, SETI just published this uh, article about the work that's currently going on that's simulating signals. So this seems like a really exciting type of experiment. Um, how is this uh, taking place and, and what do you imagine the, the effectiveness of this type of simulation to, to enable for, for future work to be done? Well, we only simulate signals, you know, not that you, I mean, we do it simply because it's a good way to test your system. You're trying to pick up signals, right? And we haven't found any signals so far from the aliens. So we'll just build this box over here that produces signals that we think would be typical for another society to send into space, to transmit. And that allows us to test our equipment to make sure that we could find the kind of signals that are you know, device makes. So it's like any other sort of testing that you might do. You know, you essentially build a model of what you're looking for and you run that against your equipment and see if you can find it. So that's the way it works. We actually are applying artificial intelligence, AI modeling to some of the searches. In fact, all the searches now uh, that we do. But, you know, that's a technical aspect that uh, improves the ability to find weak signals uh, on a planet where there are an awful lot of transmitters trying to, you know, getting in your way, if you will. But that's a technical thing. Right. And well, when it comes to the, the technical aspects and there's a lot of, of the, the techniques, the, the methodology to utilizing the, the various equipments that are at work, um, it looks like with the very large array um, in New Mexico, there's a lot of, um, you know, potentially promising results and with that underway, what are your uh, uh, aspirations on how something like the very large array there in New Mexico can come into play and, and serve some use with, with SETI's work? Well, again, th the idea here is we're trying to eavesdrop on signals from others. And if you have a bigger antenna, then you can, you know, respond to weaker signals. You can find them, right? If your antenna is small, you won't find the weakest signals. You just won't have a enough sensitivity to do that. So uh, the idea here is that, okay, uh, you know, you want to increase the chances that you'll find something. The very large array in New Mexico, it's 27 antennas. Each of those antennas is as big, if not bigger, slightly bigger, I think, than the antenna that Frank Drake used for the first SETI experiment. But there are 27 of them. So you gang them together, work them as a team, and uh, that gives you uh, uh, additional sensitivity. So these are, again, are schemes that you use to try and maximize the chances that you'll find something. What's worth pointing out here is that when I joined the SETI Institute, that was 19, what was it? It was about 1989. Uh, it was still a NASA project, but a congressman from Nevada, kind of curiously enough, uh, the, <laughs> about two years after I arrived in California, this congressman decided that he needed an issue to prove to the uh, voters of Nevada that he was trying to save them money. So he introduced a bill late at night that <laughs> killed the NASA SETI program. So that was the end of that, actually. And, uh, you know, that, that ended NASA's uh, participation in the program. But we could just, you know, keep going as long as we could find enough money to pay the people that were involved. And one of the projects that we're working on this year it's already begun, actually, is called COSMIC. Uh, that's a very tortured acronym, but it stands for, well, you can look it up, but I, I don't never remember what it stands for. But the idea there is to sort of piggyback on experiments running on the very large array in New Mexico, right? Not to look for quasars or pulsars or anything like that, but just to piggyback on the receiving system of that 27 element array in the New Mexico desert and pass it through the kind of equipment that would allow us to find a signal that could be due to a deliberate transmission from elsewhere. So that saves you the expense of having to build and maintain, you know, a very, very large instrument. If you can, you know, if you will, share that instrument with somebody who's already using it for other purposes. It doesn't mean you can't choose where you're going to point the antennas, but on the other hand, we don't know where ET is hanging out anyway. So maybe, maybe that's not such a big loss. Sounds like a fascinating collaborative effort. And when it comes to the deserts of New Mexico, people often wonder, 
have aliens visited here at some point in our recent or distant past? And when we see things, as you just mentioned with NASA, jumping into the, the game of investigating what is now referred to as UAP, unidentified aerial and now anomalous phenomena, and of course with the, the history and mythos of ufology, the study of UFO reports and, and people who investigate these claims, do you or does SETI in any way give credence to the history of this type of phenomenon or does it seem to be complementary to the work being done in, in an attempt to find out more about extraterrestrial intelligence? Well, this is an unpopular uh, viewpoint, but I don't think that there's any good evidence that Earth is being visited or actually has visited uh, Earth in the historic past. I mean, I don't know. You know, maybe in the Mesozoic era, you know, some aliens landed here to make photos of the dinosaurs. I mean, how are you going to know? The dinosaurs didn't leave any notes behind. But as far as anything in, in modern times, say the last 5,000 years or something like that, uh, I don't think there's any good evidence that we've been visited. There are plenty of stories people will tell you about. And polls show that roughly mm, a third of Americans, I think that's the correct fraction, uh, believe that not only are the aliens out there, most Americans believe that, but about a third of all the American, uh, of the American public believes that they have visited Earth, right? You know, that they made a navigation error and crashed in Roswell, New Mexico in 1948, whatever. Uh, but I think that if that were true, the proof would be in the fact that you would have lots and lots of scientists working on that, right? Because that would be really interesting. I mean, if the aliens actually came to Earth, right, in modern times, post-war, they came to Earth, you know, that would be, I mean, it's hard to imagine too many stories more interesting and compelling than that. But, you know, if you actually look around and say, how many scientists are working on that idea? The answer is not very many, right? Because the evidence is not very good. The evidence mostly consists of just stories, right? And stories are not very convincing evidence for any fact you're trying to establish. Does it seem like it might not be uh, it, it might not be viable for research data for purposes of uh, scientific pursuits, uh, and many of those claims are very anecdotal. Um, although some are very much convinced that uh, ideas of alien encounters are are real, and that people attempting various modalities of contact are experiencing something which they consider non-human in origin. When it comes to these accounts of of people utilizing various techniques in an attempt to generate some kind of connection or communication, does this seem to be something that would be considered if there were a, a demonstrable effort that was underway under scientific controlled demonstration that showed effective results? Would this be something you or, or SETI would consider looking into if those out there who uh, ascribe to these um, those, these modes of, of conscious contact, of human initiated, contact experiences. Is there anything that that you might be able to lend scientifically to those types of pursuits? Well, I mean, it's being done, actually, right? It's being done by a, a physicist, an astrophysicist, more, more accurately, at Harvard, Avi Loeb. He's very, you know, intrigued by all these UFO reports. And so he said, you know, the whole problem with the UFO story is that it's, you know, it's mostly promulgated by people who don't have much science training. He says, and the scientists just sort of dismiss, dismiss it. And he thought, well, why don't we just do the experiment? You know, you can believe me, you cannot believe me. But if you do the experiment and you find something positive, in other words, you find evidence of visitation, for example, that becomes science when somebody else can do the experiment and find a similar result, right? It's not a matter of convincing people with your arguments because those don't really amount to much in science. It's a matter of can you take data that shows that, you know, we're being visited, something like that. So uh, Avi Loeb has a project, it's called the Galileo Project. Uh, he's raised some money, $3 million thereabouts, to build equipment to do exactly what you say. Uh, he's going to, you know, I mean, this, is, this equipment's all gonna be on the rooftops of Harvard University, but it doesn't matter, right? Because we don't know where the aliens are anyhow. So it would be equipment that would be sensitive to obviously radio waves and light and stuff like that. And if there really is evidence in front of our eyes of aliens visiting the planet, we'll, we'll be able to see them. I'm personally uh, actually pleased that somebody, that Avi Loeb is doing this, 
Uh, I don't think he's going to find anything. I think, you know, we have 8,000 operational satellites orbiting the Earth right now. And uh, most of them have cameras looking down and they don't see anything. And the, the usual rebuttal to that observation is, oh, well, you know, the government's keeping it secret. But I've worked for the federal government. I had a secret clearance for the federal government. And, uh, you know, there was nothing that I knew that you couldn't just give away to, well, at the time, the Soviet Union, and it wouldn't have made any difference. I mean, so I, I you know, I'm, I'm skeptical. I'm skeptical. But it doesn't matter whether I'm skeptical or I'm not skeptical. The facts are that this experiment is being done. It's going to be done. They're building some equipment, designing and building equipment to do this. And I, I fear that it, it probably the most predictable result of all that is that it'll take a lot of the fun out of the whole UFO story. Because, you know, if, if they can't find any evidence for visitation, you know, it's going to be pretty hard to argue that, well, I mean, the government's covering it up. I mean, it's an international effort. Well, people seem to like things uh, to be more exotic than they actually are. And the issue of secrecy and defense secrecy is a very real one. Um, and to posit a hypothetical to you, bringing into um, the picture that people, as you mentioned, often do consider that there is some effort to cover up not only um, the existence of extraterrestrial intelligence or some non-human intelligence that exists here on Earth, but that we've uh, been able to somehow retrieve materials, uh, some debris, bodies, perhaps. And within this, proposition if in despite as you mentioned the what would hopefully be the effort of numerous scientists on board to try to share what i think would probably be one of the most biggest discoveries of of all of human history despite any of that if in the event that something were to actually be disclosed from the bureaucrats or the military industrial complex that says we've had red tape over this for you know, nearly a century now, or however long it is, whatever the case may be, or even if it's not government that comes forward, if someone comes forward and says, we have technologies, um, and we have something, and uh, it may even be emitting signals, uh, and have an emission uh, of some kind of frequency, would that be of interest to you? Would you or the SETI Institute be willing to offer any scientific assistance if in the event something were to be announced of that caliber? No, of course, of course. I mean, <laughs> look, if, if there's any truth to the story, you know, um, as a theoretician, a theoretical uh, physicist friend of mine said to me years ago, we were talking about this over a pizza dinner. And he said, Shostak, if I thought there was a 1% chance that any of this stuff is true, I would spend all my time working on it. But he doesn't. He doesn't spend all this time working on it because he doesn't think there's even a 1% chance that any of it is true. It, it would be very hard to keep this all quiet. Americans love conspiracy theories. I mean, man, I've lived in Europe and they're not so keen on conspiracies there as they are here. But, you know, all right, so what? But but you, you can believe on this. It's it's To me, it's very much like the stories that you hear about how some guy developed a carburetor that doubled the mileage on his for his car. Right. But that the auto companies immediately bought it up and buried it. Right. Because they didn't want or maybe I guess it's the oil companies because they didn't want, you know, cars burning less gasoline. I, I don't buy that. Right. If you really had a carburetor that could double the mileage in your car. I mean, you know, if I were an auto manufacturer, I would offer that as an option. Right. And, and even if they didn't, you know, you'd have some company spring up where they just manufactured these things and sold them on the Internet. I mean. You know, this this idea that if we're being visited, it can somehow be covered up by every government in the uh, on the planet. And it doesn't it just flies in the face of uh, rationality. It does, doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense. There couldn't be a more interesting story than to think that we're being visited. And by the way, I suppose that the FAA would have something to say about it, too, because maybe these aliens aren't filing flight plans. You know, so you, you take a trip to New York and, you know, you get intercepted by aliens. That's not a good thing to happen. Right. And that's one of the reasons why it seems like a lot of these uh, modern iterations of some investigative effort on behalf of the government look into these things uh, by way of, of threats because it threatens airspace. Not necessarily that, that the aliens are threatening, um, although maybe some people consider that could be the case. It seems to be more or less uh, a matter of if there are objects up in airspace, we don't want any collisions. We don't want anything to happen. But people are curious. And as you said, 
sometimes even conspiratorial to the notion that maybe there is something. And I would say that if there is, despite all efforts, that it deserves to be in the hands of people such as yourself who have the accolades and know how to be able to approach it scientifically and get it to the people. And, and, and with this, we can shift gears a little bit back into the the um, idea of where we're going and in the scientific direction when it comes to some of these things. If, if in the event that you know um, detections were made and, and, and SETI was able to bring forward some uh, irrefutable evidence, um, what would the process be to go from discovery to declaration? Because many people don't understand science and how things don't just, ha and you know, social media can, can be very spontaneous and things can go live and all of this, but it's not something that happens all at once. And, and can you maybe share a little bit about that process from discovery to declaration when it comes to something of this magnitude? Well, actually, it would, it would be pretty much like you would see it in the movies, to be honest. Uh, if, if we were to pick up a signal tonight, right? All right, the Institute doesn't have any, the SETI Institute doesn't have any policy of secrecy. You know, nobody's ever told anybody working there, look, if we pick up a signal, don't say anything about it. We're going to have to clear it with the CIA or who knows what, right? Nobody's ever been told that. So, of course, if we were to pick up a signal tonight, even if we hadn't yet confirmed it, you can be sure that everybody involved would be, you know, uh, updating their Facebook page to say, hey, we found a signal tonight and it's looking pretty good. You know, of course they would. Of course they would. Uh, and and uh, we've had false alarms and you see exactly that happening, right? And, you know, uh, we had to, perhaps the most compelling one was in 1997, we picked up a signal that, you know, for a while, about a day, it looked like it was the real deal. And, uh, you know, nobody had told us, well, don't tell anybody. It didn't tell. And in fact, uh, you know, a few hours into it, the New York Times was calling me up. They already knew about it in New York. So uh, that's actually the way science works. I mean, you make a discovery and, you know, there's, there's, there's no protocol you're going to listen to. You're just going to tell everybody, right? So that's what would happen. It would be a very big story. And that's actually a good thing because that means that other people in other countries with equipment that's not identical to yours will be prompted to uh, also look and see if they can find the signal, right? And if they can, you know, if you find the same signal, but in two different parts of the world with two different teams of people, you know, you're, you're going to be inclined to believe that it's for real. If you can't, you're going to dismiss it and say, yeah, well, there's something wrong with those guys' equipment. So it's a good thing, actually, and you don't want secrecy. You just, you know, science is very open and that did very, very few secrets. Well, with those types of discoveries potentially being made and announced to the world, it would seem that a spur of innovation would rise up to uh, introduce several, uh, you know, pre-existing disciplines of science uh, having these maybe new possibilities of sub-genres and, and things emerge in a way that might liken to uh, what we could call cosmic anthropology. And you mentioned a little bit of before about the, the idea of um, you know, a sociological outlook and things. What would you say might be some of the, the disciplines to come in the event that we not only make the detections, we, we declare it here in the world, we raise the standard of awareness in, in the public and, and our societies to know that we're, we're not alone in the universe. We now know uh, without a doubt with, again, irrefutable evidence that there are others, what would you say would be, you know, some of the different types of uh, scientific disciplines that might emerge from this type of instance? Well, in the first instance, it's going to be mostly radio astronomy. I say that not because that was my discipline, but it's just true. The first thing that's going to happen is you, you need people who are, can build the receivers and so forth. And then, of course, you need uh, people who know something about programming and so forth to uh, write the software to make all this stuff work, that kind of thing. But if you've actually made a discovery of another civilization, another society, you know, out there in space, okay, I, I you know, you would want to know more. You would want to know, well, are these guys biological or are they just some sort of machine intelligence? And if they're biological and I'm a biologist, I want to know more about their biology. You guys don't have DNA, presumably. You have some other molecule for encoding you know, your genome. So tell us about that, that kind of thing. I mean, it, it might be very tedious because you have to go back and forth, you know, ask them questions, set up a language, actually, a common language to begin with, and then ask them questions and wait for answers. All of that could take quite a bit of time. But what you would know very quickly is the direction from which this is coming. And, you know, you'd look on the, uh, the photos of the sky that are routinely made by astronomers, and you could 
I, I think without much ambiguity, you could quickly trace the origin of the signal back to a particular star system. And the astronomers would get busy trying to see if they could find any planets around that star and maybe zero in on, well, this planet looks like the best best bet because the temperatures are not too extreme. So you could have oceans and so forth and so on. I mean, you would be doing all that, just what's known as astrobiology, really. Uh, and and But if you picked up a signal, you would also want to know or be able to answer the question that the public will ask, which is, well, what are they saying? Right? Even aside from the language difficulty, in order to know what they're saying, you first have to pick up the modulation on the signal. In other words, you got to pick up, if you will, the sound, right, on their <laughs> in their transmission. And that requires building a different kind of receiver than we normally use for SETI for various technical reasons. But, you know, you got to build that. Now you record the sound and now you bring in people who, you know, are the kind of people who could have uh, you know, figured out the hieroglyphics in the 1830s and you have them look at it and see if they can make anything out of it, you know, that kind of thing. So, uh, ultimately, you would involve people of very diverse backgrounds. So that's good. Nothing wrong with that. Uh, the more people involved, the better. Uh, the fewer people involved, the worse, because now you're going to start fooling yourself into thinking that you understand it, whereas, in fact, maybe you don't. Right. Well, you know, it's something I think, as you mentioned, it's going to be an exciting time, a lot of potential on the horizon of, of the scientific frontier. And it seems amazing to consider, as you mentioned, astrobiology, perhaps astroarchaeology, astrolinguistics, uh, many different innovations. And when, as you mentioned, we need more people, there are a lot of young and, and curious minds out there who are interested in this. Um, and in closing, what would you say is a send off for those who are interested? You received the Carl Sagan prize for science popularization. And as Sagan was one of the biggest popularizers of as, as for science and astronomy in general, in, in a similar light, you're doing very much the same effort. And I think that's important to see that people know that this is a uh, science is fun. It's exciting. What would you say to, to people who are uh, you know going to be the, the upcoming generations to help carry on this legacy and what they can do to get involved, whether it's citizen science or, or academic research, how would you respond to that? Well, listen, I would just tell them to follow their interests, right? We don't spend, I mean, SETI is an extremely small niche uh, activity only because of the lack of money, right? That's only the only reason. Uh, when I joined the, the SETI team, as I say, in the late 1990s, or actually not even as late as that, it was the early 1990s, uh, there were like 50 people. That was the NASA SETI program. But when the NASA program got killed, you know, the number of people involved in SETI, you can count on, you know, your two hands. It's, it's a very small number, but that's money. That's money. And uh, in the future, I hope that that will be better. So if, if you're somebody who's been watching this and you think, oh, well, you know, that sounds like uh, something I'd be interested in doing. All I can do is tell you the stuff that you already know, but I'll tell it to you anyway. And that is you'd be most likely to get a job in this field if you know something about the disciplines involved. And that's astronomy, obviously, but also physics, a double E, you know, electronics to develop the equipment and so forth. But there are other things like geology and biology and so forth, all of which pertain to the question of life uh, beyond Earth. And you know, studying any of those would be helpful. Probably you got to get an advanced degree. I, I'm thinking of all the colleagues I know at the Institute, and there are very few people there that don't have a PhD. So, I mean, that are doing the science. So, you know, that's something else, and maybe that doesn't appeal to you going to school for that long, but actually it gets more interesting the longer you stay at it. So, you know, and there's no secret sauce here. It really isn't. It's if you if you want to do this, you can do it, but you just have to prepare yourself. You know, you gotta you gotta know the territory, as they said in the music man. Awesome. Well, for those who are interested in following up with the, work, with the work that you're doing, looking into any of the books that you've published or maybe coming out with at some point soon or attend any events that you're going to be making appearances at, where can they go to find out more? Well, you can always go. I mean, obviously, I have uh, plenty of colleagues, but just go to the SETI Institute's website. That's SETI.org organization. It's a nonprofit. SETI.org. Just type that into your browser and you'll get to the Institute's website. And there's just endless stuff on, on that website that you can read. You can read books about it, as Daniel's already mentioned. Uh, but there are also articles, uh, magazine articles, and so forth and so on. There's no lack of information about uh, how SETI is done and what people want to do in the future. That's great. And we're making new discoveries every day all across the world. It's something that I think 
is a really important part of the process of, as we mentioned, from discovery to declaration, we help to make sense of with all of the different people involved. I like to think that we won't know if we don't go. And Dr. Shostak, you're doing just that. You're helping to look into all of these different fascinating topics when it comes to the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. So I want to thank you for your time to be here with us in the Vortex. And it's been an honor to be able to have you and we'll see you. Thank you very much, Daniel. It's been my pleasure, really it is. Excellent.